And so in that moment, I'm sobbing. I'm feeling so alone. Yet my husband, who had been brilliant throughout this whole thing, was sat in the corner, right? So I, I wasn't. And this is something I think that so many people don't understand, that even if we have the most amazing support system, and you touched on it, it's this feeling of being isolated that nobody else gets Hi, and welcome to Beyond Empty Nest. I'm your host, Jody Silverman, speaker, mentor, and chief dare officer at Moms Who Dare. Every Thursday, I'll share stories of midlife transformation, happiness tips, and dare you to see the opportunities waiting for you so that you can make this next chapter even better than the last. If you're ready to dare, I'm ready to dare with you. Let's get into today's episode. Rediscovering Kyle after breast cancer. Is that really possible? Well, today's guest is the perfect person to share that answer with you. My friend, Karen Del Maestro, is our guest today for Beyond Empty Nest, and she is a health and transformational coach and has been working in the health and wellness field for 20 plus years. But it was after her own breast cancer and BRCA2 diagnosis in 2018 that she realized she was uniquely qualified to serve breast cancer survivors, helping them after treatment has ended to get back their energy, stop putting their needs on the back burner and feel amazing in the skin they are in, no matter how many scars they have. Karen, welcome to the show. It's always, we always have fun. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here, Jody. Thank you for, for having me back. Oh my God, I can't think of anybody when I wanted to kick off, you know, the month of October for Breast Cancer Awareness Month than you. You walk the walk, you practice what you preach. It's not easy what you go through it and then to serve others while going through it and after going through it. So I knew that you were it for me, that we had to do this. And when you said the topic was rediscovering calm after breast cancer, look, I don't have breast cancer. And yet all of us have been touched by it in some way, shape, or form. I have had my sister, watched my sister all live 24 years of metastatic disease. I have friends. I have community members within the Moms Who Dare group. So we've all been touched by it. And you don't really think about calm when you think about breast cancer. <laughs> but before I let you get into sharing the answer to that question that, you know, is it really possible, share with everybody a little bit. With, I read your bio, but who is Karen? And talk to them a little bit about your story. Who is Karen? That's a big question. <laughs> Do we need a coaching session for that? No. Yeah, probably. We have to dive deep. <laughs> uh, actually, you know what? I, I just want to, before I go into my story, if I may, just clarify the point that we are all touched by breast cancer. Because whether you are touched personally or whether you know somebody that's been through it, the statistic is currently that every 19 seconds, one nine, somebody somewhere in the world is diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh my gosh. So to, it's not unreasonable to say that everybody is, is touched by it somehow. And, and so this is why this topic is so near and dear to me because it's something that we think is not possible, and yet I've proven it otherwise. And so, yes, I'm on a mission to share. So who am I? <laughs> I will shorten this story. For those of you wondering what the accent is, let's just start there. I grew up in the UK and moved to the US when I was just 22 years old, newly married, had my children there. I was in New Jersey at the time. I've since moved... Uh, stayed in New Jersey for 30 years and then in the past eight years moved seven times, including to and from Caribbean. Lived down there for a couple of years. And it was actually shortly after coming back from the Caribbean that I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Before I touch on my breast cancer journey, I need to touch on what happened a year prior to that. Now, like most of us, 
my my journey through life has been a roller coaster ride, a bit bumpy. Been through some pretty major things, including my mom, my dad, and my younger brother. But a year prior to being diagnosed with breast cancer, it was an exceptionally stressful time for me. And this is important because I have to say 90% of the women that I speak with, and I do talk to predominantly women, I don't want to exclude the fact that there are men out there that have also been diagnosed with breast cancer. It's just that most of it's mostly women that reach out to me. But 90% of us have actually been touched and dealt with massive amounts of stress prior to our diagnosis. And in fact, it's part of something called the cancer personality traits by Dr. W. Douglas Brody, is that we go through an unusually stressful time between 24 and 48 months prior to diagnosis. That's interesting. That's, that's a little crazy. Right. So if you, if you Google... And I know you're going to go do it, right? Yes. I know you're going to. Does stress cause cancer? The answer you're going to find is no, it doesn't. However, and this is the really big however, it's how we deal with that stress and how our body reacts to that that can add to inflammation in our body and our in inflammatory response in our body. And I won't go too sciencey yeah. into it, but it's hormone related often. But it's also how we cope with stress. Now, the chocolate chip cookies, the ice cream, the wine, the numbing, bourbon, bourbon for you. There you go. For me, sour cream and onion potato chips. You know, like we've all got that thing. We're all human. We've all got that thing when we're stressed out that we tend to overindulge in. I'm saying that without judgment because we're all living this challenging human experience, right? So, so one year prior to being diagnosed for me, this was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. And this is what this cancer personality trait um, study talks about, that there is a big thing that breaks the camel's back. And so for me, a year before being diagnosed, within the space of one month, I sat by my mom's bedside as she passed away. She was diagnosed one week prior with stomach, liver, lung, and skull cancer. Really? One week prior. Had no clue. And thankfully, she also had dementia. And so... She sat on the edge of the bed, swinging her legs like a five-year-old. And I was so grateful for that, mm -hmm. for her to not have that anxiety and fear. And so I would, and that was over in the UK. So I was with her as she passed away, peacefully and calm and not knowing what was going on. The day after my mom's funeral, just two weeks later, my brother almost died. He had to have life-saving surgery, but they gave him a 50-50 chance. And then two weeks after that, the day after my brother comes out of the hospital, my husband in the U.S. calls me and says, I have a motorcycle accident. And we didn't know for eight weeks if they were going to be able to save his right arm or not. And so all of that happened within one month. And it wasn't even all local. I was in the U.K. I yeah. was here. It was, it, was, uh, it was stressful to say the least. I won't go into more of the details. But when I look back at that, it was an unusual experience to have so much on top of each other, this, these stacked traumatic experiences. And so as I'm looking at going through breast cancer and being diagnosed and discovered that I carried the BRCA2 genetic mutation, the only person that had had breast cancer in my family was my grandmother on my dad's side. Wow, that's rare, yeah. So, but there were a lot of other cancers. And so thankfully they did test me and I did find out that I carried the BRCA2 genetic mutation because I think like most breast cancer survivors or, or people that are diagnosed, we say, why? Why did I get cancer, right? We, we've got that curiosity. And so that's when I did my research and found the work of Dr. Brody and looked at what had happened in my life. And I said, okay, at that point I was 52 I've lived for 52 years with these tendencies. This was, and, and having the genetic mutation, but now that's what kind of, 
I hate to use the word triggered in this instance, but kind of was the catalyst to change how my cancer cells that we all have in our body that lay dormant, but that kind of woke them up. And so, you know, stressed out, anxious, horrible, hearing the spine chilling words, Karen, you've got breast cancer was scary. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. And my journey through treatment and all of our journeys are different and individual. Mine looked like seven surgeries in two years. And that for me was a double mastectomy followed by reconstruction surgery where I chose to get implants at the time. Three months later, I had a full hysterectomy because of the BRCA genetic mutation. So here I was without breasts, without my uterus and ovaries and looking in the mirror saying, I no longer have the things that science kind of defines me as a woman. Like it's, it's a real kick to your sense of identity. If you're used to identifying to what's on the outside. Thankfully for me and the work that I've done over the past 20 years, I know who I am on the inside. So it wasn't quite as tough for me as it has been for others. And so the, the last surgery for me, and I won't go into each one, but the last one for me was actually the decision to remove my breast implants. I, at the time, had something called capsular contracture, where my body built a hard shell around one of the implants, and I couldn't even move my left arm anymore. Plus, over 25 breast implant illness symptoms. To which my doctor said, but Karen, we can't guarantee that removing them is going to help. And for anybody that's not sure, this is such a difficult decision. And please feel free to reach out. I, I'm always open to talking to people that are going through this because it's really tough. But I was being told by my doctors, Karen, it's the side effects from your medication. Fatigue where I couldn't get out of bed. Anxiety where it felt like I was running a marathon the whole time. Hot flashes where the bed was just drenched, rain fog where I couldn't even speak. I'd look at my computer and saying, Karen, okay, I know you know what you need to do, but I'd literally look at it and say, I don't know how. And so that's the shortened and abbreviated version of what I went through through breast cancer. I will say once I removed my implants, my symptoms were all gone within a week. I've, you know, I personally have read about that and I've heard that more often than not. And, and, yeah. and, you know, you're sharing your journey and you're sharing so many symptoms and feelings and emotions around, and, and so many people listening to this can relate. Mm-hmm. And it's so important to know, I mean, when you said that every 19 seconds, someone in the world is being diagnosed, you are not alone. I mean, you want to be, you know, we don't want it to be that many people, but you can, mm-hmm. I can only imagine that knowing that so many people are going to have this diagnosis when it happens to you your world gets very i'm alone feeling yes oh my gosh yes i would think so i love that you're sharing this and you know i'm sorry that anybody you know has to go through this and i'm so you know you're sad but what you're doing is you're helping other people in the in the process and i know you say that the the journey after active breast cancer treatment ends that it's really something that we aren't prepared for. Right. right. And like, like you're, you're sharing a lot of reality of what can happen. You shared a lot of the side effects of how many surgeries you've had, side effects from the implants and surgery. And, you know, this, this is the reality of what we might expect and what somebody might experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that what happens when we are done with active treatment. And this was my experience too. I was, I was not excluded from this experience and it was actually the catalyst that made me shift my coaching program to support breast cancer survivors. I remember sitting in my plastic surgeon's office, that white crinkly paper stuck to the back of my thighs because I was now oh. having the mandatory hot flash every time I'd go into a doctor's <laughs> office. The pink soft gown draped around my shoulders, my bare chest exposed. And her saying to me, 
care and I'll see you in three months. Mm -hmm. And as you're going through treatment, you are waiting for the day that you are done. You're waiting for it because we have this expectation because of some of what we see on social media, but also because nobody prepares us that it could be otherwise, that we're here going to be jumping for joy, ringing the bell, celebrating balloons, banners, you name it. When in actuality, what happened to me, Jody, when I was sitting in that office was I had the most awful and scary, gut-wrenching sob come out of me. And I gripped hold of my plastic surgeon. And I think she probably thought I was a little, <laughs> you know, and I just said, I'm not ready to break up with you yet. Like I literally said, that because I was just like, I was scared. And I liken it to, for me, it felt like I was still walking on the high wire. Yeah. And yeah. the safety net, which is our medical team had just been ripped away from me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and. I, yeah. And so in that moment, I'm sobbing. I'm feeling so alone. Yet my husband, who had been brilliant throughout this whole thing, was sat in the corner. Right. So I, I wasn't. And this is something I think that so many people don't understand that even if we have the most amazing support system. And you touched on it. It's this feeling of being isolated that nobody else gets because they're celebrating in everybody else's mind, you're done. Come on, get back to life. It's scary to leave that, sa that safety of, even though it was all medical and yeah. it was my heart. I, 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 can, I can't get that from a cancer perspective. I can get that from a therapy's perspective. Sure. Yeah. From any traumatic event, when you have a therapist yeah. and then you're like, you're great. Or, you know, just call me as you need me. You're like, no, 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 no. I need you every week. Like, like, I can't do this thinking thing on my own. And so I, I kind of can get it from a different perspective. Yeah. And we don't think about that. We don't think about the, the anxiety level. You know, there's, we've talked about that there's anxiety when you're diagnosed. Mm -hmm. There's anxiety, anxiety during it all. Mm -hmm. There's anxiety after. And that's what you're talking about. The anxiety of, okay, now I, three months is a long time, I would think. Mm -hmm. some, Feels like it. When you've been seeing people on a daily or weekly basis for a period of time, and it's not, and, and the thing that we're often not prepared for it, and this is kind of my mission, right, is to help educate what the after part looks like. Because yeah. for me, and this may sound weird, but for, for anybody that's listening that's been through breast cancer, I, I'd love to know, but I, I suspect that they felt the same way. Hearing that you've got breast cancer, there is then normally quite a period of time, like a number of weeks before you know what your treatment plan is, right. right? And it's that waiting period. It's that not knowing. And when you know what the plan is, it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to pull my big girl panties on and this is what okay. I'm going to do. Right. I'm going to do. I mean, first of all, we're not really given an option, right? If we choose to be here and we want to live and we want to be healthy, this is what we are guided to do. But that roadmap doesn't exist when you're done. Yeah. And all we're being told is we're feeling fatigued, like we've been hit by a truck. The anxiety, the worry, the kind of knowing, I know I need to change something, but I'm not sure what I need to change so that I don't get sick again. There is so many like, worried, why am I still tired? Is this normal? Worried that your body feels suddenly drained. And what's not often talked about is that breast cancer is a trauma. Oh. And anytime you hear those words, you have breast cancer, very often there's a fleeting thought or maybe it's a longer sustaining thought depending on what you know about your, your, the, the cancer that you've been diagnosed with, am I going to die? And so we go into survival mode. We go into fight, flight, freeze, fawn. There are four trauma, automatic trauma responses and so when we're done, 
and we've survived our body literally. And, and, you know, I'm feeling this like, okay, so you've survived, you've gone through it all, you've done, 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 do, do, do. And then you're like, okay, now what? And I can see like what you say, all your friends and family, this is great, this is great. Why, what is wrong with you, Karen? Why aren't you calm? Why aren't you? This has all been important, but the, the guts of this, going back to the beginning, rediscovering calm after breast, after breast cancer, is it really possible? And it is. I know it, it is. is. You shared that it is. <laughs> so, because for the person that's going through it, you know, there is no calm right away. And if you don't have the tools and strategies, and I know that that's your jam, and you do it so beautifully for women. And so as we're, we're nearing the end of our episode here, can you share a few things that we can do to help bring ourselves to a more calm state? Whether we've been through breast cancer or not, it will help you. Absolutely. Regardless, this is what are, give us like two or three things that we can do to help bring ourselves to a more calm state. Absolutely. And yes, it is possible. 100%. I recently went through 13 biopsies and I stayed calm throughout. And so I know firsthand and what I share is always often from my own knowledge. So one of the things that I think is so important is staying calm and it, it's getting in touch with all of the spinning that's going on in your mind, right? I, it's like we've got a snow globe up there and somebody's right. shaking it and we've got all of these thoughts and you, I know you talk about thoughts a lot and how many we have and they're spinning, spinning, spinning. And so the idea of calm is thinking about getting those, those thoughts settled down. So. Number one, I invite you to think about, can you control what's going on in your head? Now, this is strange. And this is what I say to my clients with my biopsies. I couldn't control the outcome of those biopsies. Right? When we go in for right. our mammography, our MRI, our scans, our tests, we can't control what the outcome is. Yet we worry about it. We're scared about it. We go to the what ifs and we take it to the worst place possible. And I always ask, are you trying to solve problems that you don't yet have? So that's a good way to stop to spinning is asking that question. Ask that question again. Are you trying to solve problems that you don't yet have? And when we are projecting, and this is for everybody, right? We all do this. But when you're projecting and going through all of the different scenarios and trying to figure out how to solve each one, it, you are using so much. And by the way, so much energy too. Yeah. And our energy is so precious. So doing that. So thinking about what you can control. Are you trying to solve problems that you don't yet have? Okay. And another one would be asking yourself, and I think this is so important. Who is minding your mind? Who's up here? I like to think of two personalities in our head. And I'm talking about our self-talk, right? What is your self-talk right now? Because one is going to make you more anxious and one is going to make you calmer. And I have these two avatars for want of a better name. One is called Negative Nancy. She's the one that beats you up all the time. She's the mean girl. She's the one that tells you, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you there yet? Yeah. Yep. You're no good. You can't do this. She's that one. I don't like her very much. And so I try to, and I, this has been a process. This is practice. I try to kind of push her to one side gently and say, not today, Nancy. No, not today. Instead, I invite in positive Pamela because she's your biggest cheerleader. She's like, you can take a rest. You deserve it. And I don't want you feeling guilty about it either. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm not talking false positivity, but she's oh. really the one that's on your side. She is your ally. She is your cheerleader. And many of my clients have actually said, Karen, we've got a third one. And I'm like, really? Who's your third one? And they're like, it's calming Karen. Oh, uh, there you are. Well, you are, Karen. You have a calming nature to you because you've practiced, you've practiced 
the self-awareness. If the, it's, it's being aware of when your mind is hijacking yes. you and your yes. emotions and yes. taking it back and saying, okay, I, am I really trying to control something that I don't even know is happening yet? Yeah. It's not easy. It's a practice. It's so listen to these two practices again, mm -hmm. because you'll, when you become aware of negative Nancy, you'll know negative Nancy's on her way to visit you before she even forms her, her sentence. And then yeah. you can put positive Patty. Was it, was it positive? Positive Pamela. Positive Pamela. <laughs> but yeah, the more you, you pay attention, the quicker you can knock out negative Nancy. So those are two great practices. Thank you very much. Absolutely. It is our, our minds hijack us and hijack our emotions and make us craze. But as your video talk show on YouTube is called, it, practicing these techniques mm -hmm. will take you from crazed to calm yeah. over time. So we'll put a link to that below as well. Awesome. Two last things really quick. You are giving, there's going to be a link to a download. Mm -hmm. You're giving us what 50 encouraging phrases to calm an anxious mind. Yeah. And, and I did this because so many of my clients were saying, Karen, I just need to hear you in my head because you calm me down. And they were even taking it. This is an audio download. It's an MP3 format. So you can actually download it onto your phone. So it can be with you. You can fall asleep to it. You can go through an MRI. They can actually, for any of you going through testing, they can, they, they're often playing their own right. music. But if you go in with an MP3, they can play it through their system also. And so listening to this as you're going through those things, they're, they're phrases that are, you know, is it, it's Mommy. designed for breast cancer survivors, but they're relative for all of us. Yeah, all of us. I think. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, you know, it, it's like having calming Karen in your head. So oh, you want a calming Karen in your head. And finally, first of all, thank you. Thank My you pleasure. for being part of Beyond Empty Nest and this very important month mm -hmm. of October where we're doing everything we can to bring awareness to breast cancer, support those who have it, support those who support those who have it. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is um, some great tips. Your story alone will make others feel less alone. And yet you don't get out of the Beyond Empty Nest Zoom without a dare. Everything that you, what will you dare? There's so many dares I could pull from this conversation. I know. Aaron, one dare, a simple dare that you want everybody to do this week. I'm going to dare you to do a brain dump before you go to bed at night. And what does that mean? That means get out of your head all of the things that are spinning and put them onto paper. This has been proven to help you sleep better. Do it again at 3 a.m. after you've got up to go to the bathroom and you're trying to get back to it. sleep. Yeah, and your head's going again, right? Do your brain dump again. It really works. And it's a great way to calm an anxious mind. Love it. You're doing a brain dump. Doing a brain dump. All right. <laughs> Tell it again, thank you. And, and everybody listening, share this episode with somebody you love, somebody you know who deserves to go from crazed to calm. Anybody you know that needs a little more calm in his or her life, share this episode. Let us know, leave a review. Tell Karen what was the one thing she said that made you feel less crazed and more calm. We wanna hear from you because the more you review, the more you share, the more women we reach and that's our goal. So leave a review, like it, let me know, let Karen know what you like, what your takeaway was. Don't forget next week, we'll be back again with another episode of Beyond Empty Nest. And as I always say, say with me, Karen. Dare on. on. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond Empty Nest. Head over to jodysilverman.com for full show notes, more information and additional resources. Speaking of additional resources, I've got a great one for you in the show notes below. So if you've enjoyed today's show and are ready to embrace this midlife chapter, then you're going to want to grab our featured resource called the Self-Talk Cleanup Challenge. You may not think so, but to quote our friend Oprah, the one thing I know for sure is that negative self-talk and thoughts are what's keeping you stuck in fear and lacking confidence to take the leaps in midlife that you desire to take. 
But when you grab this resource, you'll receive the exact exercise my first coach took me through. It's simple, yet powerful. In addition, I'll send you a few other tools and tricks to help you knock out the negativity when it shows up, thereby increasing your confidence and your overall happiness, allowing you to have fulfillment and fun in midlife. You deserve it. So go ahead and grab your copy of the Self-Talk Cleanup Challenge, and I'll see you next Thursday. Until then, they're on.